So it's a great pleasure that I introduce our next speaker, Gena Gorari, a good friend of mine. He's a doctoral candidate in the UNR Cognitive Brain Science program. He teaches psychology classes at UNR also, and he does a lot of research study on the fields of optical illusions, perception, and memory. And so he's going to talk a little bit about how we've evolved to see optical illusions. Can you hear me? Okay, good. good. Um, so, there were rumors that I'd be doing magic tricks. Oh. Uh, prepare to be disappointed. <laughs> uh, my talk is about um, optical illusions. And it's called Seeing Through Illusion. I will begin by showing you an image that some of you um, may find familiar. This little cluster of pixels is the Earth, as viewed from some cosmic distance. And this was made famous by Carl Sagan. If you're here for Ben's birthday party, please come to the blue party room. Happy birthday, Ben. And please bring Ben in the blue party room. And Carl Sagan, in the pale blue dot, famously writes, From this distance, the Earth is a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Well, I want to briefly talk about the sunbeam itself and its importance for life on Earth. Without the sun, the Earth would be a barren, desolate rock flying aimlessly through space. No heat, no energy, no photosynthesis, and life, at least as we understand it, simply could not exist. Okay. But in addition to all this, <clears throat> the sun also provides a very rich source of information. Okay. Light permeates the world. It bounces off objects, and any organism that can learn to interpret this information will stand to benefit greatly. You will have knowledge about its surroundings. And so approximately 500 million years ago, we see the emergence of eyes. Now, today eyes are ubiquitous throughout the animal kingdom. They come in all shapes and sizes. They're found in all different levels of complexity, from rudimentary um, patches of light-sensitive cells to some much more sophisticated specimens, such as the falcons that we saw earlier. Actually, they have two phobias, I believe. So the eye evolved so that we can see. And ironically, though, we don't actually see with our eyes. The process that we call perception happens not in the eye, but in the brain. Another marvel of the evolutionary process. The purpose of the eye is to collect light information and send that information to the brain, where it needs to be interpreted. Now, some interpretations are accurate. Good afternoon, Discovery Visitor. Other interpretations birthday party. are less accurate. The blue party room for presents and games. Again, please join Ben in the blue party room. And sometimes we can observe a discrepancy between the properties of the physical world and our subjective experience of that world. And we call these discrepancies illusions. Now, illusions can teach us a lot about how the brain works, okay? So, just to give you an example, actually, if you guys can scoot towards the middle, some of these will work better if there's room. <clears throat> So just to show you how our subjective experience can differ from the underlying physical reality, what I want you to do is look at the cross. And what you'll notice is that there's a green dot moving around in a circle. Now this green dot you see does not actually exist. It is an illusion. It's not there. <coughs> and the motion you see is not real motion. These are static images that your brain fuses together into the experience of motion. And this is the basis for cartoons, uh, movies, and television. Now, as you keep staring at the center, so fixate your eyes and don't move your eyes and stare right there, you might also notice the pink dots beginning to fade away. You guys see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you fixate really hard, if you're really good at fixating, you can get all the pink dots to fade away so that all that's left is a non-existent green dot yeah. that's not moving yeah. <laughs> in a circular <laughs> orbit. So in essence, you're seeing the opposite of what's physically present. Okay. 
So the, uh, the green dot you see is an after image from the pink. And the pink dots disappear through a process known as Troxler fading. I'll show you another example. So here's the famous Cheshire cat, the disappearing Cheshire cat, and we're going to make him disappear. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to focus again on the center cross and observe what happens. The image will slowly begin to fade. Right? First the eyes, then the face, then the head, then the creepy smile. And eventually the whole thing will fade away. Now, <clears throat> why does this happen? Well, let me give you um, an analogy that might make it clear. So suppose I have a small object, a quarter, and I place it on my arm. Okay? I feel the tactile presence of the object on my arm for a couple seconds. But eventually, that experience fades away. Okay? I no longer notice it. And the reason that happens is, is the neurons that are coding for this um, tactile experience of the object on your arm become bored. They start to fire less, okay? Because the stimulus isn't changing. And as a, pro and as a consequence, <clears throat> the sensation evaporates from your awareness. And so something similar is happening here. As you fixate on the cross, the image on your retina, which is the patch of light-sensitive cells in the back of your eye, is stationary. And the neurons that respond to the stimulus begin to fire less, and less and less, and eventually the image disappears. It evaporates from consciousness. Now, the reason we don't see this all the time is because we're always moving our eyes, right? We're always staccato. But if I were to paralyze your eyes, so that you can't move them at all. The whole world would fade away. You would go blind. <laughs> so for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to show you a number of other illusions, and in the process, learn a little bit about the brain and how it makes sense of reality. Well, let's talk about color. <clears throat> now, color may not seem all that important. I mean, yes, it beautifies the world around us, but if you were to lose your color vision, presumably life would go on. Fair enough. <clears throat> However, if you're a lowly primate, trying to survive in the wilderness, <coughs> would you still notice the fruits in the tree? Or the predator lurking in the brush? So color is important. It played a role in our survival. But color may not be what you think it is. So this is a black and white image, we agree. And what I'm going to do for my next trick, <laughs> I'm going to make your brain turn this black and white photograph into a color image. Okay? And here's what we're going to do. So I want you to stare at the center dot. Just stare and don't move your eyes. And we're going to look for approximately 30 or 40 seconds. And in the meantime, I'll tell you what's happening in your brain. <clears throat> so as you're looking at this image, there are populations of neurons firing to all different colors. Okay? And their firing rate is going down. Now, the way color vision works at the cortical level is that there's what's called an opponent mechanism. So every color has an opponent color. And so in the case of purple or pink, we saw the green dots. And each one of these colors also has its own opponent color. So as you're staring at the dot, <clears throat> as the neurons to these colors are firing less, it temporarily throws the system off balance, such that the opponent colors will become easier to stimulate using regular white light. <clears throat> so keep staring for a few more seconds. And now keep looking, I'm going to change the image. <laughs> and presumably you see a color photograph with blue skies and lush green grass. Except as you move your eyes, you can prove to yourself this is the same black and white image you were looking at earlier. So the colors you experienced were completely illusory. They were a hallucination of sorts. Now, however, this isn't all that unusual. 
Because in a sense, our experience of color is illusory. Right? If you think about it, color does not exist in the physical world. If you're a physicist, you don't study color. You can study light and properties of light. But what we call color exists purely in the perceptual domain. And our processing of color is actually very interesting and, and very strange sometimes. Okay. So looking at this image, <clears throat> we can all agree that there are blue swirls and green swirls. Right? Now, is there anything I can do to make this blue and this green appear to look the same color? Well, that's a true question. It's already the same color. And I can prove that to you by removing the background. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about motion. <laughs> by the way, th there's no motion here. <laughs> um, imagine losing your ability to experience motion. What would the world be like? Well, in his book, The, the Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, named literally after a man who mistook his wife for a hat, the late neurologist Oliver Sacks <clears throat> describes a woman who lost her ability to see motion, a condition known as akinetopsia, caused by brain damage. And she describes her world as a succession of static images, without the fluidity and continuity that we experience in an ever-changing and moving reality. And so you can imagine <clears throat> simple tasks like crossing the street suddenly become terrifying because you don't really know where the object is. You see static images. So motion is important. <clears throat> we want to know which objects are moving, how fast, and in what direction. However, motion can also help us see the objects themselves, in some cases. So for example, does anybody see a bird? No? No birds? A bird, yes. Okay. What about now? stops and now it disappears, even though the object is still there. So in this example, the individual elements, the, these line segments, were bound together through their common motion to create the experience of a single moving object. And when the object stopped moving, that binding broke down, and the bird is still there, but you no longer see it. Now, as it turns out, there are different kinds of motion. And one kind of motion that some scientists are very interested in is motion that's produced by living creatures. This is called biological motion. Now, I'll show you an example. Okay, so here we see some white dots in the black background, and presumably you see the outline of a person. Right? But if I make these dots move in a specific manner, now you experience a person walking towards you. These are just thoughts. <laughs> or, sit, or walking away, yeah, for some people. It's, it's a big mix. Yeah, I say walking away from Walking towards you, walking away, but it's walking. It's a person yeah. walking, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, as it turns out, your brain can actually extract all kinds of really sophisticated information from these motion signals alone. So for example, this walker up here might appear sad, slashed over. Right? This walker down here might appear happier, more upbeat, right? more confidence in the step. This walker might appear feminine. <laughs> And this walker might appear masculine. So, 
so I mean, think about it. it really, a high level, of sophisticated social information being extracted from white dots on a black background. I think that's impressive. <laughs> Let's talk about shadows. Now, as the brain struggles to make sense of reality, it has to use as much information as it can. And even information that you may not think is very important, like shadows, can nonetheless change what you experience. So for example, are these objects floating up into the air? Or are they laying on the ground? All I did was change the shadows, and subsequently, your brain's interpretation of this image. <clears throat> Let's look at this example. Now, surely we can all agree that check A and check B are two very different shades of gray. Right? This is a dark gray, this is a light gray, maybe even white. What if I told you that A and B are the same exact shade of gray? Would you believe me? <laughs> but it doesn't matter what I say, I can prove it to you. I'm going to remove all the background, okay? So leaving just A and B, and we'll see what they really look like. A and B are exactly the same shade of gray. So what's going on? Well, your brain has to figure out <clears throat> the lightness or the darkness of a surface, right? How dark a surface really is. And how do you do this? Well, one strategy could be to measure how much light is being reflected from the surface. So bright surfaces reflect more light, dark surfaces reflect less light. And so maybe you can have some objective measure of the darkness of the surface. But there's a problem. Because based on the illumination in the environment, the same surface can reflect radically different quantities of light. So in other words, a dark surface under high illumination can reflect more light than a bright surface under low illumination. So there's ambiguity. And the brain has all kinds of hacks and tricks and strategies to get around these problems. So in this case, A and B are reflecting the same amount of light, you see that here, the same shade of gray. But when I add Context, okay. specifically <coughs> shadow, I trick your brain into thinking that B is submerged in shadow. Okay. Now, if two surfaces reflect the same amount of light, but what is in shadow, it's probably brighter. And so your brain compensates for the shadow by making this appear brighter. Even though that's not really the case. Looking at this photograph, <clears throat> presumably we all see a crater. What else could it be? But how do you know that this is a crater? You've been there. <laughs> suppose, suppose you hadn't been there. So you got me. It's a shadow. Yeah, how do you know? It might seem like a strange question to ask. We just know. We look at it and our perception system makes a conclusion. Now, as your brain tries to interpret reality, it's making assumptions all the time. And one of those assumptions is that light in the atmosphere is coming from above. Okay? So, if light is coming from above, the only way that this can be a shadow is if this object is a crater. Okay. Well then, what happens if I take this and flip it upside down? You'd see an upside down crater, right? Not so fast. Let's find out. There it goes. Oh, look at that. Now it's a mound. Because if light is coming from above, the only way that this could be a shadow is if this object were a mound, and so you experience it as a mound. Okay. <clears throat> I'll prove that to you by again removing the background. objects are exactly the same size. So what's going on? Well, again, these two objects are the same size and they're the same size in your retina. OK, 
Okay, they project the same size image on your retina, and your brain knows this. But now I'm going to add background. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that background. And this background contains depth cues that the brain usually uses to estimate depth okay, and distance. And I'm tricking your brain into thinking that this image is further away than this image. So if two objects are the same size on the retina, but one is further away, oh, well, it must be larger. Right? In the real world, this would be the case. And so your brain makes this object appear larger based on these assumptions. Even though, again, <clears throat> your eyes are lying to you. Um, similar story here. Now, surely these tables are different dimensions. Uh, they have to be. There's no way that's the same, right? Right, no way. <laughs> or, or, are there assumptions being made about depth that make this table appear more elongated than this table? Let's find out. Uh -oh. Oh, wow. Look at that. They're exactly the same size. That's crazy. Now, for my last one. For my, for my last one. Um, this doesn't fit neatly into any category, but I like it because in some sense it's analogous to the process of perception itself. Okay, this is called the healing grid. And so the process of perception that I've been referencing is a process of construction. The brain is constantly filling in missing information and making inferences on the basis of incomplete information. Okay, with that in mind. So this is the healing grid, and you can see that in the middle, the grid is uniform. Right? But it breaks down off the sides. It needs some healing. Okay? So in a minute, I'll ask you to look at the center cross. But for now, realize that your vision is actually the best, has the most detail and acuity in the fovea, which is where you're looking. And as you go out to the periphery, vision becomes worse and worse and worse. Okay. So now, do me a favor and fixate on the center cross. And as you do so, your brain is trying to understand what's happening in the periphery. There are enough resources to process that information. And you might experience the grid beginning to heal itself as the brain constructs a plausible reality in the absence of reliable information. You guys see that? Okay. So, what does this bring us? What can we conclude? That, this is not a movie, by the way. That's actually a movie. <laughs> so, for, for thousands of years, philosophers have argued about the relationship between the physical world and our subjective experience of reality. So in other words, do we see the world as it really is? <clears throat> so I began by showing you what I think is a very humbling image, or right? the Earth from some cosmic distance. I want to show you another humbling image. This is the electromagnetic spectrum, and this little sliver is all that we can see. We're blind to the rest of it. So, what happens within this visible spectrum? How does light end up as a perceptual experience? Well, at any given moment, a tiny, degraded, two-dimensional, ambiguous pattern of light signals falls onto your retina. That information is then translated into a language that the brain can understand. The brain doesn't speak in light signals. It speaks in, in, in neuronese, neuron fires, right? <clears throat> the, the information goes to the brain, and then the brain has to make a best guess as to what objects in the world were most likely to have caused that pattern of light signals to fall on your retina. And in essence, this best guess at any given moment constitutes your conscious experience. Now, this is usually an accurate guess. It's an educated guess. It's a guess that's been refined through eons of evolutionary time. But it's still a guess. And as we've seen throughout this talk, sometimes 
the brain guesses it correctly. So I want to end <clears throat> with a quote by one of my favorite scientists, uh, V. S. Ramachandran, who writes, <clears throat> indeed, the line between perceiving and hallucinating is not as crisp as we like to think. In a sense, when we look at the world, we are hallucinating all the time. One could almost regard perception as the act of choosing the one hallucination that best fits the incoming data. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much.